Hello everybody and welcome back to Marriage and Kinship. Today we will be talking about matrifocal societies. So previously we read a paper by Jane Collier, Sylvia Yanagisako, and Shel Rizaldo that argues that ethnocentrism and universal definitions of a family or the family can cause us to misrecognize the relationships of people in different cultures because not everybody actually fits that universal model or maybe the universal model that we made is bad because it's based on limited information from our native cultures and we're trying to apply it to other people and it just doesn't work. In a related paper, Sylvia Yanagisako and Jane Collier also argue that there are no facts, biological or material, that have social consequences and cultural meanings in and of themselves. And if we take this really seriously, this has some pretty intense consequences for how we understand gender and kinship and also sexuality. So to give maybe one really common example, People often say that because women carry children and breastfeed, that they should stay at home in order to do that, and that motherhood is this natural instinct that everybody with a uterus has, and therefore motherhood is a woman's primary job and women shouldn't work and if they try to work we should pay them less to encourage them to stay at home all of these things that follow on this idea that people with uteruses who bear children should be doing particular social tasks because of that biology but you know what humans have invented all kinds of helpful things like breast pumps so that women can mechanically express their breast milk and put it in a helpful freezer. And then another parent or caregiver can take that breast milk from the freezer, warm it up, and feed an infant. Or there is baby formula. Or in a pre-technological solving this problem way, um, there is milk from other animals that can be used, or you can hand your child over to another person who is lactating to feed them. And that works. So the biology does not determine the social role. There are other ways to manage it. So today we're going to talk about some of these relationships that have often been misrecognized and see how it is that anthropologists misrecognize them and misunderstand them, basically. So let's talk about matrifocality. The first person to use this term, Raymond Smith, defines it as pretty much what you would expect it to mean as a focus on the mother. Matrifocal households are often referred to as female-headed or woman-headed households, and the fact that we have to go out of our way to describe these households as woman-headed households instead of just households tells us that there is something unusual about them and that the thing that's unusual is that a woman is the head of household because we would expect a man to be the head of household. So if there's not a man who's in charge of this household, there must be a man missing somewhere. And Blackwood also cites two additional definitions from scholars who are very clear that part of their understanding of matrifocality is that fathers and husbands are absent most of the time, and that the relationships that women have with heterosexual partners are fleeting and tenuous. 
So in working class Afro-Caribbean households, as described by Blackwood, women are heads of households. Men are present. They can be present in two ways. The first way is as consanguineal relatives of women in the household. So sons, brothers, uncles, grandfathers, whoever. Or they can be there in more or less durable heterosexual relationships. The relationships might last a long time. They might not last a long time. Now, notice that women are heads of households, but there are actually adult men in these households, right? Um, presumably her brother is an adult or her partner is an adult, but he's not the head of the household. There is also a wide variety of household types. There isn't necessarily this very rigid idea of who constitutes a household. You don't have to have mom, dad, parents. Let's also talk about the Minang Kabau of Sumatra, Indonesia. They're a very classic anthropological example. In this society, women own houses and land. Ownership of the houses and the land is passed through the matriline from mother to daughter. Men don't get houses. The Menengkabau are also matrilocal, so husbands move into their wives' households and they are subordinate to their mothers-in-law and to their wives' brothers because the Menengkabau are strictly unilineal. Men are not part of their wives' matrilines, but live with her family as guests. So in their wives' households, they don't really have any power. It's the mother-in-law who has the power in the household. It's the wives' brothers who are actually part of that matriline who have power in the household. And they also retain obligations to their own birth families. Mother-child descent ties are generally considered more important than marital ties. And finally, we might say, okay, so I guess if you have a house and land and you have to pass them down, maybe you're adhering to this old system, but what about neo-local marriages? And the thing is that even when we look at neo-local marriages, we see that women retain control of land and finances because the understanding in the society is just that money and land and houses are, are women things. So why should we focus on matrifocal societies? Or why do so many social scientists focus on matrifocal societies? Some social scientists who are focused on solving social problems have noted that matrifocal societies or woman-headed households are associated with poverty in the Western Hemisphere. But the assumption tends to be that it is the absence of a man in his role as breadwinner and head of household that causes the poverty. And I think we have to question, are they really linked that way? There are other totally plausible explanations, like the fact that women are typically paid less than men. Um, so sexism <laughs> is the problem. Or the fact that um, this is something I've learned from my own research is that when people don't have enough money, to feel like they can really support a household, they don't get married. So actually the problem goes the other way around and if you want more people to get married, you should pay them all more money. Other social scientists or social commentators have been concerned about weak marriages or unstable relationships as another social problem, but I'd like to ask you, what do you think makes a stable family? Is it the stable presence specifically of a mother and a father who are married? Or is it just a stable adult presence and enough money to live comfortably? 
But a really great reason to focus on matrifocal societies is that they potentially demonstrate kinds of kinship that don't rest upon the foundation of a heterosexual pairing. So in describing Black American families in North America in the 70s, Carol Stack talks about networks of kinswomen, related men, and friends within and across households who are really important. And I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, as a kinship scholar, I read that and I just want to know more. So basically what happens is when we focus on women-headed households as some kind of anomaly, it's because we're hunting for men because we think they're missing. But it's not that men aren't missing. Men are part of these households, part of their children's lives, part of their nieces and nephews and grandchildren's lives. Um, You know, men are there. They're just not in the place that they're supposed to be, according to the kinship chart. So the point that I want you to take home from this, um, more than anything else, is that studies of matrifocal societies have focused on the lack of recognizable kin formations. Recognizable according to who? According to the Malinowskian model? Rather than focusing on the apparently functional kin formations that are actually present. There is an assumption that these families are dysfunctional because of the fact that they don't correspond to the models we know. But does that mean that they're actually dysfunctional? Why aren't we understanding how they actually work? And so Blackwood says that this fixity on the trope of the patriarchal man has led anthropologists to misrecognize other forms of relatedness as less than or weaker than heteronormative marriage. And so finally, the real missing men are the men that we're overlooking. The grandpas, the uncles, the brothers, the sons. They're still there. They're just not in charge. So how do we avoid doing this? How do we avoid an ethnocentric analysis that relies on a familiar model that might not apply elsewhere? Blackwood suggests that rather than positing anything universal, researchers should look for webs of meaningful relationships in their historical and social specificity. And One question that I really want to hear from you about in the comments is, where have we heard something like this before? And I would also love to know, what kinds of kinship do you think that we fail to recognize when we try too hard to put a definition on what kinship or marriage is? Is there a way to define kinship or marriage that actually meaningfully includes all of the important human relationships in the world? Thank you so much, and I will talk to you next time.